And I pray that you be with us during this uh, BFL class, especially this men's class, as we focus on uh, just great men from the Bible so that we can emulate them and learn the lessons that you would have for us to learn from their lives. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning we're going to look at uh, a man who was uniquely uh, exalted in history by being the one man on earth that God boasted about to Satan. We're talking about Job. And we're going to focus on him. Now, what I've given you is a summary of uh, the lessons that I learned from the entire book of Job, and I want to do that because I think, frankly, it's more important to learn the lessons of the book of Job than to emulate the character of Job. If any of you think that you're close to being that one person on earth that God would choose among all the people on earth to boast about, saying, have you considered my servant and put in your name, Please talk to me after the service. I think we need to kind of get together and say, look, I think there's some humility issue. We're going to talk this morning in my sermon about Peter. He was pretty much at that place, wasn't he? Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. So in Peter's own estimation, where did he put himself in terms of loyalty to Jesus? Uh, He's top. He's at the top of the list. Well, Pride goes before the fall, that kind of thing. So I don't think anybody in this church or whatever is saying, hey, look, I'm in Job's place in my generation. That doesn't mean, however, that there are not timeless lessons from his character that we should learn. And I want to summarize them at the beginning. But better, I think, if Job were here, he'd say, you know, I don't so much want to talk about my piety or to talk about the character traits that I displayed in my life that I think you should emulate. Rather, I want to get you ready to suffer. I want you to get you ready to suffer well. And that's what I'd like to do with most of our time. But uh, I want to begin by summarizing some of Job's virtues as a man and lay those out just, and it's not in your handout, it's just, but you know the text and you know the book. And uh, I'll walk through those. But then I'm going to walk through the uh, timeless lessons that I learned from the book of Job and I want to share with you. So let's begin with Job's character traits. And we see this especially in Job 1 and 2, and especially in Job 31. This is not in your handout, so just, just listen. You can open to, your, to Job 1 and 2 if you want. But you're familiar with the story, and uh, so this will be uh, somewhat of a review for you. But the book opens with a character, Job, being introduced to us as blameless and upright. All right? So right away, that's an amazing statement. The word blameless is something that we in the New Testament bump into in terms of qualifications for elders. An elder must be blameless. Now we know from the overall teaching of Scripture, this does not mean morally perfect. Job doesn't claim to be a morally perfect man. But what it means is that there would be no one that would have a testimony against him. There would be no witnesses that could be summoned and uh, to, to be said, this individual is, is a bad man for this or that reason. Uh, that's how I think about qualifications for elders. Uh, specifically on the topic, can this man uh, serve uh, as an elder? There would be no witnesses that would say, no, I don't think he would be qual- uh, qualified to serve for this reason. That's what I think blameless means. And upright means that it, it's, it, it's a matter of justice or righteousness that Job lines up with the standards of righteousness that the Lord had laid out. He was a righteous man, and so his life lined up with that. So blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And so that's a very important aspect. He lived in faith, aware that God saw his every step, as he says later in the book, he, that God watches him all the time. That's a man of faith. And he is aware that any misstep, that he would be vulnerable and and God would have every right to punish him or discipline him or even take him out. And so he feared God and shunned evil. All of these character traits are vital. He's acclaimed as the greatest man in the East. It's tied there to his material prosperity, but in that sense of understanding that all of that prosperity had come about in Job's life um, as a connection with the way he lived his life. And so uh, we're not prosperity gospel people, and I don't think we should say because someone's wealthy, they're a righteous person. That would be an error. But the way it's written in Job, it it talks about his prosperity as a good thing. So he's prosperous, but more than that, he was a pious man. 
Job 1.5, uh, said uh, from time to time when his sons, or his sons and daughters would gather to have a feast, um, when the, uh, the cycle of feasting had run its course, he would, it says, send and have them purified and offer sacrifices for them thinking. Perhaps they had sinned uh, and cursed God in their hearts. So this may be that, uh, Job 1.5 may be one of the greatest displays of godly parenting, Christian parenting, we say in the New Covenant, Caring about the spiritual condition of your children and specifically their heart condition. That they were, that they might have been looking good on the outside, but inside something corrupt. Now, this tells us a lot about Job, doesn't it? Because later on, as his friends, I'm going to give you the air quotes on the friends. You know, it's one of these things with friends like that, dot, dot, dot. So they were not great friends. Because by the end, one of them, life, as I think, says, is not your wickedness endless? I'm like, oh my goodness, how do you get to that place? I just want to say, where's your evidence? There was none, because it wasn't. And they're listing all of these crimes and sins that he must have committed because he's suffering so greatly. You, you remember this whole thing. But uh, Job understood that all that really mattered is what God thought, and God sees everything. And so what matters is what's going on in his heart his private life, his own private life, and that of his children. It also shows that his children were leading outwardly moral lives, outwardly pious lives, because he wasn't saying, you know, I'm going to offer sacrifices for my openly wicked sons and daughters. He wasn't saying that. So they were godly too. So it's really a remarkable display, talking about Job, um, and just going over a summary, it's not in your handout here, but talking about his positive character traits. And then secondly, we have God's, commendation so all of that that i've been talking about was written in the text right it was it was uh, what the bible said about him and then god we we have god saying these things to satan have you considered my servant job which is a remarkable thing now i believe when i wrote my book on heaven i believe god's going to say that about all of his children to all of his children and to the angels so that we have an opportunity to consider what god did in and through each of his sons and daughters. Why? Because God is glorified in their lives. But this is unique now, this is special, where he is choosing one person. There is no one on earth like him. Now, he's not going to say that about all his sons and daughters. He's not saying that. We're not all equally spectacular in our service to God. There's some that just sacrificially serve better than others. But have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. And then that same statement, this is a man who is blameless and upright, who fears God and shuns evil. So it was God who thought that and then inspired the writer of Job to say it about him, but he's commending him. And then over the whole, uh, the whole book, we have a display of what James celebrates, uh, James 1, 10, and 11, uh, or James, sorry, 5, 10, and 11. Um, um, his patience and suffering. And I'm going to use that to transition over to, um, you know, when I'm done giving an overview of Job's character, to transition to the lessons I want to give you on suffering. But that's, that's what James picks up on on Job. You, you've seen, you've heard of the patience of Job and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. And so we want, we, we want to em emulate those heroes of the faith, according to James, who were patient in suffering who suffered well. And that's why I've chosen to give you those lessons. Because some, at some point in your life, and this is one of the great tragedies of life in this sin-cursed world, you're going to need the lessons from the book of Job. I wish you, I wish you didn't. I wish I didn't. But we're going to need it. And so I want to get you ready through the story of the book of Job to suffer well. But these are character traits that are worthy of emulation. And then you have a very unique chapter later, Job 31, Job 31, and I want to lodge this in your mind, is a parallel to Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31, the godly wife, the wife of noble character, remember? Most of our sisters in Christ tell us that they don't really like that chapter very much, you know? It's like it kind of stands over them and they feel judged by it, right? Well, it is a very convicting chapter and it's, you know, it's helpful, um, and, uh, but I think Job 31 is a parallel for the virtuous man, where Proverbs 31 is the virtuous wife. Here you've got the virtuous husband and father. 
Now, it's couched in Job's final defense for himself. He basically says, here it is. This is my, this is my last will and testament. I'm going to sign this in my blood. This is who I am. And I'm going I'm to put it in front of all of you who are accusing me of secret wrongdoing, and I'm going to put it in front of the whole world, and I'm going to put it actually in front of God. And, and it's almost like an oath. If I have done any of these bad things, basically let God strike me dead, because I haven't. I mean, that's what he's saying. And so we believe that this uh, personal testimony about Job is true and therefore worthy of emulation. He begins in Prover uh, sorry, there you go, Proverbs 31, Job 31, by uh, saying, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a, at a young girl. And so that commitment to sexual purity, which Jesus uh, elucidated for us in the Sermon on the Mount, it's not enough not to just commit adultery, but what's going on in your heart. So Job has a concern for heart religion which just totally cuts the ground out from under his accusers. Because there is no evidence of any visible sins in Job's life. They would have had immediate witnesses on that. So it had to be at night when no one was looking. When everyone in the whole community was busy doing something else, he's doing all this evil. I don't know when that, how that could have even happen, but he's like, but that's just not who I am. I have a commitment to heart purity. I have a commitment to a heart religion, a heart, heart piety, a godliness. And you as men, you can't do any better than that. What are you really? Who are you really? That's what the Bible is searching us out. And he said, look, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young girl. And he goes on uh, about this. He fears God concerning this matter of sexual purity. He said, if I had done any of these uh, sexually immoral things, it would have, quote, uprooted my harvest. What an image, right? Imagine being a corn farmer in Indiana. I always think of that because I used to drive the entire uh, south to north length of the state when I was in Louisville. I went up to Grand Rapids, Michigan and drove through the state of Indiana. I've never seen so much corn in all my life. It just went on as far as the eye could see. The highway just went right through that as we're going up to Indianapolis and beyond, going up to Michigan. And I'm like, my... But I had, when I thought about this, an image of a corn farmer and waking up one morning and all of the stalks laying flat, dead. All that work, all that money, everything, gone. And uh, he has that image. It would have uprooted my harvest. And so he is very concerned about sexual purity, and so should we be. And then he goes on in Job 31, 13 to 15, talking about justice for servants. He saw them as human beings, not as cattle or as property. God made them like he made me. And he treated them that way, which would have been unique back in, in, the, in, the, in those days. And then care for the poor and needy in, in Job 31, 16 through 23. And then uh, he comes to it again in 31, 32. Uh, he fed them from his table. He met their needs. As, as he saw a need, especially concerning food, he would feed them. He would raise up the orphan boy uh, almost as one of his own sons, he said. Poured into him, trained him, clothing for the naked. Uh, advocated for them, justice in court, spoke up for them in court. Um, he was hostile to or against any form of idolatry, anything that the people of the ancient Near East would have worshipped, the sun, the moon, and then the number one idol there's ever been in every generation, gold, money. He didn't put his trust in his gold. And uh, he didn't gloat over his enemy. You know, he had a concern and a care for his enemy, even as a human being. He wasn't happy when he failed. Um, and he fundamentally was not a hypocrite. He didn't conceal his sin as men do. It's an interesting statement. I am what I appear to be. That's my defense, and I sign it now, and I present it to you all. That's Job 31. So that's my summary of Job's piety and his godliness. What I want to do with the rest of our time is to learn what lessons he learned. Somewhere in the 31 sermons that I preached in Job, I came to this realization. Um, and I've said it many times. It's kind of my number one slogan from uh, the book of Job. Job was a better man than we will ever be. But we have a better hope than he ever had. Um, what does that mean, a better hope? The phrase, a better hope, is handed to us by the author of the book of Hebrews. Better than what? Better than the old covenant hope. That's what we have now. Now that Christ has been raised from the dead, we are through the gateway of Christ's body, 
and blood. We have come into a whole new world now. A whole new world where we understand the afterlife. We understand what's coming. We understand what Jesus meant when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then through his apostles, especially John in the book of Revelation, we have visions of the world that is coming, right? The new heaven and new earth, where there is no more death, mourning, crying, or pain. And we have a vision of a new Jerusalem, a radiant city of glory in which the glory of God is illuminating that place. That's where we're going when we die. And so therefore, Christians, martyrs, you know, people that came after Christ ascended to heaven had lost their fear of death and could say with the Apostle Paul, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's better by far to go. Do you get that in Job? No, you don't. And actually, you don't get that with any Old Testament saint, as Athanasius pointed out. Old Testament saints had a murky, somewhat shaky view of the afterlife. In Sheol, no one praises you, that kind of thing. They would say this kind of thing. It's like they didn't really have a developed personal eschatology and where we're heading, but Jesus gave that to us. And frankly, not just positive, but negatively. Who taught the most about hell? Who taught the clearest about hell? Was it not Jesus? Did he not tell us? It's a place of darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Did his apostle John not give us that vision of a lake of fire? Did Jesus not give it to him when he said the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, quoting Isaiah? And so Jesus gave us that clear vision of where we're heading. So I'm not trying to speak hopelessness over you when I say Job is a better man than you will ever be, but you probably know what I'm talking about now as we've gone over Job 1 and 2 and Job 31. It's like emulate imitate as best you can but thank god you're not going to stand before god on judgment day based on how well you imitate job but instead how perfectly righteous jesus was and that his righteousness has been imputed to you and in that righteousness you stand now and we'll stand on judgment day so let's walk through these timeless lessons um what does it mean to suffer well how do we understand that? Uh, I sum it up in uh, Job 13, 15, what many Hebrew scholars say is a mistranslation. But I'm saying I'm going to use it anyway. Because even if it is a mistranslation of Job 13, 15, I actually think that it is the, the message and the purpose of the book of Job. And it is the overall message of the entire book of the uh, entire Bible. Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. Even on my deathbed, I will have hope. What is hope? A feeling, a sense in my heart that the future is bright. I'm going to something better. Well, I've already told you a few moments ago why that is. Because Christ is the resurrection and the life. And even though we die, we will live with him. And we will have a resurrection body made glorious like his. And we're going to go into a world that he will have completely renewed As the scripture says, behold, I'm making everything new. We are able to hope in him. That's what it means to suffer well. No matter what disease may be taking you out of this world, and not just you, but your loved one too, your your spouse, a child even, we can still suffer well because we know that the sting has been removed from death, right, because of Jesus. And so it is Christ, not Job, but it is Christ that helps us suffer well. Let me turn it around and let me ask you, what does it mean to suffer poorly? How would you define suffering poorly? We have all the focus on you and your suffering. It comes out as complaining and all the bad stuff, but the focus is you instead of God. All right, you're focused on yourself, not God. Or Or to charge God with wrong. Yeah, I would say that'd be a good way to sum it up. It's a vertical problem. You're suffering in this physical, temporal world, and you're doing what vertically with God? You're speaking hard things against Him, right? Speaking disrespect. You're questioning His love for you, or His wisdom, or His power. One of those attributes you're going to question if you suffer poorly, right? You're going to say somehow, God doesn't love me, right? Right? Or God doesn't know what he's doing. 
which I think is the centerpiece of his defense when he speaks to Job out of the whirlwind, right? And gives him a whole raft of natural theology, right? Whole bunch of natural theology, like the sun, the moon, the stars, the planet, mountains, rivers, clouds, seasons, 10 animals, the ostrich, all that. Gives him all that. What's the point? I know what I'm doing. And you don't even have the slightest conception of what I'm doing. I mean, that's how it works. That's the counseling strategy. Interesting counseling strategy. But he's basically saying, let me fly the plane. I know what I'm doing. That's what he gets. So suffering poorly is to question his God's love or his wisdom or his power. You know, he's just, he can't control these things. No, he's in charge. He, he controls. So that's what suffering poorly is. Do you think that's a possibility for you that you might suffer poorly? Is there any chance, is there any indications on day-to-day -day basis that you might suffer poorly if something big really happens? I, I give proof every day that I'm likely to suffer poorly. So I need help here. I really do. I need help to suffer well. I want to suffer well. Meaning, I want to hope in him. I want to do more than just not charge God with wrongdoing. Job did get to the second trial, but he's already starting to crack at the seams a little bit. And you know, as the thing unfolds, and we find out not only the book of Job, but the trial goes on a little longer than we'd like it to. All right? I didn't find, by the way, a lot of preachers that went through every chapter. I didn't have a lot of examples to work with. People are like, wow, what a long book. <laughs> It's just chapter after chapter after chapter. It's like, what am I going to do with all this? A lot of them summarized, you know, a bunch of things, like they'd pile it all into one sermon. It's long, and, and I think at least, this is my conjecture, is that it's long because the trial goes on longer than you want it to as well. It just keeps hanging on. The chronic illness is still there two years later. You're still battling it, right? And when that happens and it bears down on you, some things are going to start bubbling to the surface, things that you didn't know were in you. And that happened with Job, didn't it? So he had good cause to repent at the end of the book. All right, so we're going to walk through quickly these 10 lessons and however far we get, we get, um, and you've got the handout, um, and you can study it. And I've already preached this on two journeys, um, but we'll walk through it. First of all, suffering will most certainly come, but don't live in fear. I said a few moments ago, someday, maybe even now, you're going to need the book of Job. You're going to need the lessons here. All right? It's going to come, but don't live in fear. So we need to have a proper view of life under the curse. Job 5, 7, man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. That is true. We're going to have trouble. Uh, Job 14, 1 and 2. Man born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. He springs up like a flower and withers away like a fleeting shadow he does not endure. Uh, sometimes it seems to me that we're surprised when trials come. As though something strange were happening. Like, what's this? Didn't see this coming. That kind of thing. Like we expect somehow a trouble-free existence. Uh, we forget that we're descendants of Adam and Adam brought this on himself and his descendants through his sin. And the wages of sin is death. That includes aging that results in death. That it, uh, includes disease that results in death. That includes accidents that result in death. And not just death, but the loss of prosperity. There are these great trials that happen in Job's life, wave upon wave, remember? The loss of prosperity, the loss of loved ones, and the loss of personal health. Those are categorically the three biggest trials that can come on us physically, materially. And uh, we have to be ready for any or all of them and not, not be surprised. Uh, remember that God, because of Adam's sin, cursed the ground. Cursed is the ground because of you. You're going to labor on it and you're going to pour out sweat on it and it's going to produce thorns and thistles for you. It's the book of Ecclesiastes. The stuff you worked on is vanity and dust in the wind. So don't be surprised at it. All right? But don't dread the trials before they come. That would be a bad way to live your life. I don't know. The hammer might fall today. Today could be the day. You, don't, you can't live like that. Job says, what I feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. God doesn't want us to live like that. You know, in fear and dread uh, that we're going to lose our wealth or our loved ones or our health. We instead have to see the final purpose of God in Job's life as all blessings were fully restored to him in the end 
And we know that that's just a foretaste of heaven, right? So Job gets all prosperous at the end and gets children to kind of replace his other kids. No child can replace another child. But, but really, it's a foretaste of heavenly blessing in which you're going to get property of your own, the New Testament calls it, that will never be taken from you. Why? Because you'll never die. And you're going to get family, not just your own immediate family, biological family, but in Christ, your brothers and sisters will be yours forever. Your friends will be yours forever. That's what we're pointing toward. So that's what we're looking for. In the meantime, God is going to manage your temporal stuff as he sees fit. He's going to give it, take it away. He's going to use it as a tool to sanctify you and to advance the gospel. He's going to use it. And it's fair game. It's his anyway, right? So we have to be expecting that he's going to use our property, money, our loved ones, and our bodies as he sees fit. And he has the right to do it, uh, but it doesn't mean he doesn't love you when things come at cross purpose of what you would like. So fundamentally, we have to see all this by faith. Faith drives out fear. Again and again, we see fear and faith, especially in the New Testament, as juxtaposed or, or opposites. Faith or fear. Fear or faith, often. There's a certain kind of fear that faith is designed to drive out. There's another kind of fear, which is good, which we you know, are introduced. He fears God and shuns evil. That's a good thing. But there's a different kind of fear that's faithless. Oh no, I might lose my health. Oh no, my, I might lose my possessions or I might lose a loved one. Don't, you can't live in fear of that. And so Jesus um, you know, says, don't be afraid, just believe. He said that to Jairus, right? Um, or uh, the, the disciples in the boat with a raging storm. You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Well, because we're professional fishermen. I've been on this lake since we were little boys and we think we're about to drown. Yeah, but I'm in the boat with you. And I didn't get sent into the world to die in a tragic boating accident. So where is your faith? All right, so that's, that's it. Just fear dries out faith. Number two, love your earthly blessings, but hold them loosely. All right? We can't say, look, um, our possessions, our loved ones, and our health could be taken at any moment. So not only am I going to not be attached to them, I'm not going to even like them. All right, well, you can't do that. You can't live that kind of life. In one sense, it would be like an ascetic life where you choose not to involve yourself in the blessings of this world because you might be addicted to them or you might have them taken away. That is not what the Bible teaches, is that kind of asceticism. God has created foods to be enjoyed and taken with thanksgiving. Uh, he's given us blessings that we're supposed to involve ourselves in. And you would be a bad father if you didn't love your children dearly. You'd be a bad husband if you didn't love your wife dearly and make the most of the time you have. So love your earthly blessings. Every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who doesn't change like shifting shadow. See God's goodness in all your blessings. Thank God for them. They are blessings. Just because he might later take them away, which he might and has the right to do, doesn't mean you shouldn't enjoy them now as evidence of God's love for you. God provides richly, richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Yet, the book of Job clearly does teach us to hold them loosely. What does that mean? What do you think I mean by that? It's not a Bible phrase. But what does it mean to hold your blessings loosely? It means if he takes them away, uh, it, it doesn't strike at uh, anything fundamental in your heart towards God or towards life itself. It doesn't, doesn't kill your joy. Doesn't kill your hope, your peace. Be generous. Be generous toward others. So horizontally to be generous, to not hold on to them because you're you're a miser. And then vertically, when God comes calling for them and takes them, and he's not going to ask your permission, he's just going to do it. But you're not like white knuckled holding on. So he has to pry your fingers out to take that loved one away or that possession. Don't be like that. When he comes, give it to him. It's his anyway, right? Everything in the universe is his. And, and especially I see that with children, right? There's sometimes, and I, it's tragic when it happens, where someone will lose a child and be angry at God because he took my child. The word my there in his estimation or her estimation is problematic, right? What do they mean by the word my child? It's almost like you created them. And God in that whole scenario is what? Concerning your child. Like a thief almost, right? 
like you've been mugged. It's like, well, you, you don't seem to understand, God would say, who I am concerning your child. I mean, look at Job 10 there. He's speaking about himself, but isn't this true of every human being? Remember that you molded me like clay. This is Job speaking to God. Will you now turn me to dust again? Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese? clothe me with skin and flesh and knit me together with bones and sinews. You gave me life and showed me kindness. And in your providence, you watched over my spirit. Well, that's true of all your children too, isn't it? God made them. I mean, intelligently, meticulously put their bodies together and gave them mysteriously whatever it is, but we call it a soul. What is it? It's life, it's existence. God alone can give that. And he owns it, doesn't he? He owns everything. And so for you to hold your children loosely means love them, understand that they're mortal, you're mortal too. The relationship in this present form is temporary anyway. The best thing you can do is lead your kids to faith in Christ so you have an eternal friendship with them. How awesome is that? But uh, don't act as though God has stolen your children from you, as though you own them more than he does. You, you don't. Really, they're his, and he entrusted them to you, right? Isn't that really the case as a father or as a mother? God entrusted the children to you for care, that you would take care of them and feed them and raise them up, but they really belong to him. And we are vulnerable in this present age. Cast but a glance at riches, and they're gone, for they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. So money can, can just go away. So understand that. And don't charge God with wrongdoing. Instead, James says, we ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Everything, it's like in him we live and move and have our being. That's how we suffer well. So suffering well means, as you look at your possessions and, and your family and even your own health, right? I mean, think about your health. How, how great a tragedy is it in this world to lose forever? a physical capability, right? I mean, certainly blindness, you can't see. The rest of your life, you never see color again, nothing. Would that be a trial? More than you can measure, right? It'd be significant. To be unable to blank for the rest of your life, is that a big deal? Yes. Certainly it is. Not minimizing that trial. So that's your health, right? To have your health taken from you so that you have a trouble getting just physically even out of bed. Like think of in a nursing home at the end of life things like that so anyway understand god is in that all of that all right number three understand satan and his relentless hatred and the hedge of protection one of the big themes of job it's interesting to me is satan's activity in human suffering all right it's it's satan's involved right he's he's there it's like we have these hidden activities of satan the lord said to satan where have you come from Satan answered the Lord from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Is he still doing that, this roaming stuff? You better believe he is. And not just him, but his demons. You know, people talk about guardian angels. I think we have whatever the opposite of guardian demons is. We have, you know, demons assigned to our case, like C.S. Lewis had. I think that's probably right. People, demons that know us and know our weaknesses and orchestrate flaming arrows of temptation. All right, it's good to know that. Uh, understand that they also bring about, have the power to bring about tremendous human suffering. They can do, uh, and the actual, uh, the actual trials are indirectly ascribed to Satan in chapter one and directly ascribed to him in chapter two. Satan struck Job's body with sores. It's like, so you don't have to wonder he did that. He has the ability to bring disease on a person. But Satan went out from the Lord, and then suddenly the Sabaeans are coming, and, the, you know, and then well, it's like, come on. I mean, just put it together. It's Satan, too, in chapter 1 as well. So Satan's doing this kind of thing. But it begins, the book begins with Satan frustrated concerning Job. Remember? He's frustrated. Why is he frustrated? Well, because of this so-called hedge of protection. You put a hedge around him and everything he has. What does that mean? The hedge. God wouldn't let Satan do everything he wanted to do. He couldn't get at him. And therefore, Job prospered. He couldn't get at his flocks. He couldn't get at his body or his family. He couldn't get at him. 
until God opened a way, opened a door in the hedge. But he limited it. He said, you got your marching orders. You can do this, but not that. Right? Chapter 1, don't touch his body. But you're free to do whatever you want with his possessions and his family. And what did he do? Well, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. That's what he did. So how do we put all this together? Satan is involved, but God is sovereign. That's how I put it together. And I have come to see more than just a hedge of protection. It's more complicated than that. I more see it like a vast, intricate, complex floor plan or maze that goes like as far as the eye could see. Imagine like a maze with all kinds of, do uh, of walls and doors. And it's dynamic. It's changing every day. And you get demons running through the hall like the Pentagon, right? And then suddenly a gate opens up and they flood in and then the gate shuts right behind them. And now they're in a little antechamber and they do some damage in there and there they are. And then, like the pigs, remember the demoniac of the gatherings? They go out and the pigs, you know, that's how I see demons in the world. And who's causing the gates to go up and down and who's orchestrating all that? You know who it is. It's God. And it's incredibly complex. But they're doing his bidding every day. So what does that say to us? Well, that God is going to control our trials and will not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. Satan has to ask permission. Sometimes he's arrogant about it. Simon, Simon, Satan is demanded to sift you like wheat. Demanded, is it? Is that it? Is that what we're doing? Demanded? Does God owe Satan anything? Never. But Satan has an attitude. Have you noticed that? He's definitely got an attitude. So he's demanding to sift the apostles like wheat and God allows it to some degree so we should understand this should be part of our worldview our understanding of evil and suffering the world must involve Satan and demons but also God's hedge of protection and and understand how that works uh, you know I'm not even get into behemoth and Leviathan you're like no oh, no I think they're just two more animals it's like that's fine you can think that if you want it's like all right fine behemoth and Leviathan are just two more animals and and ten animals wasn't enough you wanted to also talk about the rhinoceros and the crocodile this is what you know and then this is what I have to put up with when I read commentaries um, so at any rate it's like all right do that if you want isn't it interesting how Satan just literally disappears out of the story and we never see him again as though he's no longer relevant. How could he be no longer relevant? Because the rest of the, the book is about human suffering. And apparently Satan did all of it to some degree. At God's permission, yes, but he did it. So we need to be mindful of it. And uh, Ephesians 6, put on your, your spiritual armor. Understand you're going to battle every day. And that, and that your prayers for protection, for God's protection, are reasonable. God protect us. Ask him to do what he said he would do or wouldn't do. Please, Lord, don't let me or any of my family be tempted beyond what we can bear. It is reasonable to pray that. Please show us the way of escape that you've orchestrated so we can get out of that temptation without sinning. Those are good prayers, aren't they? That's exactly how you should pray. Learn from Scripture what God does and pray it back to God. You're not teaching God something new. He's teaching you something new. So that's how it is. So pray for him to do that. I don't know where I am on this handout at all. So let's go on. Um, all right, number four. When suffering comes, re respond like Job did. I would add to it at first, all right? But keep in mind, at the end of the book, he says, uh, God says to uh, Job's friends, through one of the friends, said, you have not spoken what was right about me as my servant Job has. So in the end, that was the final word. The fundamentally, God said that about Job. He thought right about me and spoke right about me. Isn't that beautiful, really beautiful, how a holy, perfect God sees the best in his servants? He knows the truth, but still he commends us. On what basis is he going to say to any one of us, well done, good and faithful servant? You've been perfect in your service to me. Enter into the... He didn't say that to anybody. You've been faithful. You've been faithful. That's what he's saying. So he's not looking for perfect servants, and in the end, he is able to find what's good in Job's life and say, this is true of him. He overlooks a lot, doesn't he? God does. He has to overlook a lot to commend us at all, but he commends him. And so how did Job respond? Well, look at verse 21, 22, chapter 1. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord, has, Lord gave, 
and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Boy, if you could get there in your walk with Christ. Do you see that? What an incredible place that would be to see your life and to see God and Christ that way. And it's like, Lord, I don't think I'm there yet, but I want to get there. And you know the best way you can get there is, is practice on today's annoyances and trials. It could be in your drive home. May it not happen, but it could. Little annoyances, little irritations, or little practices, little opportunities for you to praise God and, test, and trust God and all that. Get ready for the big ones by doing, he was faithful in little, be faithful in much, right? Faithful in the little trials, you get ready for the big ones. And there's a big trial coming to all of us. And it's called the day of your death. That will be a trial for you when God puts you to death, takes you out of the world, and you realize you're in the ICU or whatever, you realize there's nothing more the medical community can, can do for you. Not everybody dies knowing they're dying. I mean, accidents take people out and they're done. But sometimes you know, you can see it, you can connect the dots. So to die well, right? So you, you're able to say, in all of this, I'm not going to charge God with wrongdoing. I'm actually going to see his loving hand in all of this be able to do that, to not charge God with injustice. And then again in chapter 2, he said, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In other words, God is wise in mixing it up with us to give us a good measure of both things we consider blessings and things we consider trials. Not too much of the one or, or too much of the other. He mixes it up. And you know, you're mature enough to know you can't only have those things you call blessings in your life. Why would I say that? You can't only get the sweet stuff in your life. Why would I say that? From now till the day you die, you can't only have hot fudge sundaes. <laughs> it's just true, all right? <laughs> but why? Why is it true? We're, we're cursed by sin and God also wants us to grow through suffering. He wants us to grow. He's doing a work on us called sanctification and hot fudge sundaes doesn't get us there. And as a matter of fact, from James, count it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds because that, you know, that particular trial is essential. But on the other hand, it can't only be hard trials too. Why is that? Day after day, you're pounded, 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 pounded like on an anvil. Why is that not going to do it either? You have to experience God's goodness as well. There have to be those moments like in Pilgrim's Progress of respite where you're at a place of renewal and restoration. You get a meal, you get a good night's sleep, you get refreshed because you're going to crack. You just don't have limitless strength. You have to have your strength renewed and God knows that. So then there's going to be a mix. All right? What mix? Do you think you could decide what the best mix is? Would you think you're wise enough to figure out what you really need? It's like, Lord, leave it to me, and I, I'm going to do, I'm going to do 90% hot fudge Sunday and 10% those hard, hard things, you know. It, no, it can't. It, it's, God's like, you don't know what you're doing, but I do. I mean, how many of your brothers and sisters who have gone before you has God successfully navigated them through this world into heaven? All of them. And now he's working on you, and he knows how to do it. And that's a beautiful thing to think, isn't it? So don't charge God with wrongdoing. Trust him. Fifth, expect God to use the suffering to probe you, expose you, and convict you. What I got out of this is Job degenerated. All right? As time went on. He did his best at the beginning and then is beautifully restored at the end. But he starts saying some things that are pretty, I mean, if you, maybe you didn't notice, but I, you know, as I walked meticulously through, I was like, whoa, 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 what did you just say? And there are some things that he says that he needs to repent from later. Like one of the things he says is that God enjoys hurting his children. He delights in it. He's like, it's, and he accuses him, definitely accuses him of, of injustice. Because one of the first things that God says out of the whirlwind is, who is this that charges me with injustice? You're going to charge me with injustice? Basically what's going to happen is you're going to be quiet and I'm going to talk to you. We're not equals here. But he definitely charged, charged him with injustice. So um, what that means is you have, as Job did, hidden pockets of rebellion and disobedience and unbelief and murmuring and complaining. They're down in there. And when things are good, you're not going to show them. 
But when the heat comes and you get pressed on, it's going to start oozing out. Don't be surprised when it happens. Just say, Lord, I knew it was in there and I'm ashamed of it. I am. I don't want to be like that. I don't want to charge you with wrong, wrongdoing. I don't want to murmur and complain. I want to be better than this. So just when you start seeing it happen, it's like catch yourself and it's like, all right, it's happening. It's coming out. I confess it to you as sin. I'm sorry, Lord. I don't want to be like this. I'm suffering poorly right now. Please forgive me and help me. So that suffering is going to probe you. It's going to expose you and it's going to convict you. And so in the end, Job has to repent. He puts his hand over his mouth. All of those things um, the trials are meant to sanctify you and show you who you really are i actually believe that's part of the purpose of god in sanctification it's not necessarily completely to make you a better man 20 years into your christian life it is that but it's also to educate you on how much you needed jesus as a savior you're getting an education any chance the moment you were converted you underestimated your own sin any chance at that well you know it's true it's like, all right, the Holy Spirit is now here to educate you and show you the depths and, and twists and deviousness of your own heart. That's what's going to go on. And he's going to use suffering to do it. Number six, develop a deep, powerful sense of the overwhelming majesty of God. Probably one of the most moving sermons I preached in the Job series was, it was based on Job 13, 11. Would not his splendor terrify you? Would not the dread of him fall upon you? What would it be like if God showed up for you in a theophany one day? You know what a theophany is, where God shows up in a measure of his glory in some supernatural display of himself. Did that happen to Job? Yes. He showed up in a whirlwind. All right. Did it happen to Ezekiel? Yes. An almost incomprehensible vision of the greatness and majesty of God. And the same thing happens, it happened to Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration, radiant glory. And the human beings that experience it do the same thing every time. What's that? They fall on their faces in abject terror. So let me, let me ask you, would not his splendor terrify you? Do you think God has the ability to terrify you with his splendor? He does. Well, why would it be beneficial for you by faith to kind of imagine that? Why was that helpful? To picture yourself on your face before the splendor of God. Amen. Why would that help you? Why would that help you suffer better? We're just prideful. You know, sometimes I'll think that way. It refocuses you who is truly in charge. Yeah. To quote Romans 9, who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God? I mean, you think it's good to think like that? Who am I to talk back to God? I think it's good to think like that. We are no one to talk back to God. You know, some time ago I, I put a little spin and I just heard it differently. One of these great, great moments that we're all looking forward to. You hear it at Christian funerals all the time. What I want to hear more than anything is, well done, good and faithful servant. It's like, well, that's great. I'm glad you want to hear that. But hear the rest of the verse. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful to a few things. What do you get out of that phraseology? You've been faithful to a few things. A whole lot of unfaithfulness. A lot of unfaithfulness. You didn't really do much. I used you. And there are a whole bunch of other people that I was using as well. Does that kind of put you in your place? Should you be put in your place? Yes. Don't think too high of your achievements, or your contributions, or anything. You're just a servant, like Luke 7, 17, 7 through 10. I'm just a servant who tried to do my duty, and even then I didn't. So it's good to be humble, and his majesty will humble you. I think these verbal descriptions of the majesty of God that you read about in the Bible, you need to translate them into what if I were there, what would I be doing, and then you have the fear of the Lord, and it helps you to suffer well. I mean, there's that speech, uh, Job 38, 1 through 11, I won't read it, but where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? I mean, what a statement, right? Did I ask you for advice about anything? Do you think I ever will? Do you think there's anything you could tell me that I haven't already thought about, right? This is God. It's good to be hum humble. Seven, don't ever question God's love, justice, or wisdom. That, I have already contended, is what it means, in part, to suffer badly. Those three attributes emerged as I studied the topic of suffering as the ones most likely to be questioned by us. 
right? Those are the three. Either, or, and, whatever. God's love and or justice and or wisdom is failing me here. All right? Why? Well, because we don't feel love when God's pounding on us and taking things from us. We don't feel love by that. Or we feel, feel that it's unjust, that we're getting something we don't deserve. Or, or God's wisdom. No, don't do that. So, you know, it's interesting how Satan said, if, if you stretch out your hand and strike, him, and strike all that he has, he will what? What will he do? Curse you to your face. That, dear friends, is a good example of suffering badly. Isn't it interesting how Job's wife was a satanic mouthpiece saying almost exactly the same thing that Satan was trying to get him to do. Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. Does that sound familiar? should. How is it, and I'm not saying she was a satanic person, I'm saying that Satan can take us captive temporarily to say things to each other that ought not to be said. Could be your wife. You could do it. You could play that bad role for her. And so, fundamentally, um, as the trial wore on, Job's negative attitudes toward God became more pronounced and more shocking, as I said. Job 9, 17, and 18, he would crush me with a storm and multiply my wounds for no reason. Wow, no reason? Imagine getting to heaven. It's like, God, that affliction there. That was, did you, I mean, what was that all about? I actually have no purpose in that. I really don't. I don't have an explanation, Job, to give you. But I'm glad you're here now in heaven. Enjoy just beautiful place. Enjoy. I had no reason for any of that. No, can you imagine that? No. God is a perfectly rational being. He has a reason for everything. But Job thought he's crushing me for no reason. And then, this is probably the worst thing he said to God. Job 9.23, when a scourge brings sudden death, he mocks the despair of the innocent. Think about that. God mocking them, making fun of them, enjoying their suffering. It's impossible. God does not willingly afflict the children of men. He doesn't enjoy it. As though God is some vicious tyrant. Don't ever question him. Eight, do not expect here on earth a full explanation of your suffering. Right? Job wanted that. God, would you please tell me what you're doing? All right? It's that why question all the time. Why are you doing this to me? But if you look at when God shows up in the whirlwind, how much of an explanation of his purposes and his reasons and all that does he give him? How much? Of all the words he says, as he goes through, where were you when I made this, the sun, the moon, and the stars, and all that, we get done with the ostrich, like treating her young roughly, we get done with the whole animals thing. Ten animals. That's it? Yeah, that was it. And then Job repents, and then God comes back with the two other animals, and then Job repents some more. All right, in all that, where's God's explanation for why he took his children? Absolutely. So literally zero. There's no explanation. What does that tell you? He doesn't owe us. He does not owe us an explanation. Do we think he does? Some people do. You owe me an explanation. You don't, God doesn't owe you anything. Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? God doesn't repay anybody. He doesn't owe anybody anything. For from him and through him and to him are all things. He can do what he wants with his things. He doesn't owe you an explanation. Do you owe God an explanation? Yes. You'll give it on judgment day. I always picture like, I don't know why, like a, the questioning room in a police station and you're waiting, you know, there's this metal table with a metal chair and then the door opens and in comes Jesus with this big thick folder and takes the top one and opens it up and says, all right, now. <laughs> Do you want to go through all that? But it says in 2 Corinthians 5, we're going to have to give an account on the day of judgment for everything that we've done in the body, whether good or bad, every careless word spoken, Matthew 12. You're going to talk to Jesus about it. You owe him an explanation. He doesn't owe you anything. But will he give you an explanation? I actually think he will. Because it says in Genesis 18, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? God doesn't want to hide things from us. He wants us to understand his thought process. So he doesn't owe it to us, but he is going to give it. But will he give it now on earth? No, that he will not do. What he does is he gives you the book of Job and the 65 other books of the Bible. And that's enough of an explanation, isn't it? 
That's enough. That'll get you through. It'll get you through life here on earth. And then in heaven, you'll get the specific explanation. I really believe this. That's coming. All right, nine. Know that in Christ you have a perfect mediator and redeemer. All roads lead to Christ. How do we find Christ in the book of Job? Well, probably the number one way I find Christ is by what, how he's not there. And how, remember I said Job is a better man than any of us will ever be, but we have, what, a better hope than we ever had. So I find Christ more than anything else in that. Because of Christ now, we have a better hope concerning life and death. Christ is our better hope in life and death. Awesome. But there are statements that Job makes along the way that point toward Christ. For example, he's looking for a mediator. Remember? Someone who will lay a hand on us both. Someone who would be my friend and would speak on my behalf. If only there was someone to arbitrate between us, to lay his hand upon us both. That's a picture of a mediator. Someone in between. And Jesus, as the God-man, is that. He is our mediator. And then Job 19, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not another. How my heart yearns within me. Jesus paid for that. His resurrection. Paid for Job's resurrection on the cross. And so that's the Redeemer. That's what Redeemer means. The one who will redeem him by the payment of a price. That's Jesus. Because Christ has come. Life, death, resurrection, ascension to heaven have been perfectly recorded for us. As well, as well as the doctrine of salvation, the page of the New Testament, we have a much clearer sense of Christ as our mediator, redeemer, and savior through all of our sufferings. He is God with us, walking through our trials with us. Furthermore, since Christ has been raised from the dead, we know that this world is not all there is. Resurrection and eternity in heaven, free from death, mourning, crying, and pain, is the answer to all our deeper questions. That's why we have a better hope than Job did. Um, that's why, all right, if you want to know better hope, look at Job 17, 13 through 16. This is Job's wor- one of Job's worst statements when it comes to, this is anti-hope. If the only home I hope for is the grave, if I spread out my bed in darkness, if I say to corruption, you're my father, and to the worm, my mother, or my sister, where then is my hope? Who can see any hope for me? Will it, mainly, ho- namely hope, go down to the gates of death? Will we, hope and I, descend together into the dust. That's a hopeless man, right? I'm just saying we don't have to die like that. We can go down to the gates of death knowing that Jesus has opened. He holds the keys of death in the grave, right? Jesus does. And he's our redeemer. He'll walk down with us. Like in Pilgrim's Progress, when Christian and Hopeful are walking across the river. It's like, oh, make me like Hopeful. I want to cross the river like Hopeful. He waded across ankle deep like in a stream. That sounds like a good way to die. But Christian was like drowning and swamped. And the angel had told him it will be easier or, or harder based on your faith in God. And so Hopeful went right across relatively easily. Christian had a harder time. But it doesn't matter. They both made it to the other side. It matters some. But the more hopeful you are when you die, the better. All right? And then 10. Know that in heaven, God will perfectly restore, vindicate, bless, and educate you. You want your vindication? All right? How about your own resurrection in a glorified body? Is that vindication enough for you? That's you standing in all of your enemies, the world, flesh, devil, dead at your feet. Isn't that awesome? The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. How would you like to see that? And not just for you, but your brothers and sisters, through your resurrection from the dead. And then, all your possessions, you're given the same better ones. Like, better. Uh, Yeah, your sons and daughters better. They'll be better in heaven than they are now. You're like, thank God. All right? But so will you be. All right? You get resurrected sons and daughters if they're in the faith. I know that, you know, we don't get a guarantee that all our biological kids will be there. I'm not saying that. But I am saying those that are believers, you get them. And you get all of it. You get vindication. You get possession. And you get education. As I argue in my book on heaven, he'll explain himself fully to you. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. All right. uh, We're out of time. And I really do need to go. So I'm going to close in prayer and we'll move on. Lord, thank you for the things we've learned from the book of Job. Thank you for the man he was, as we see in Job 1 and 2 and Job 31. But thank you for the lessons that he learned and that he makes available to all of us. And now as we go to corporate worship, give us strength, give us clarity, give us passion, give us faith. Uh, help us to hear the word of God and to sing it back to you and praise it. 
Um, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.